Hello everyone and welcome back to the Cyclocross Social Podcast. Today it's time for a big preview episode. We will be taking a look ahead at the World Championships in Hogerheide this weekend. With me to discuss that is Isam. Yes, thank you for having me. All racing this weekend in Hogerheide will be live and uninterrupted on GCN+. Make sure to head to gcn.eu slash cxsocial for a 25% discount on your annual subscription. This is a special offer for our listeners from the UK, USA and the Netherlands. So head to gcn.eu slash cxsocial for your 25% discount. Let's go into the racing then, Isam. Let's take a look ahead at the men's race first. There's really no way we can go around it. The most epic rivalry at the moment in cycling, Van der Poel versus Van Aert, will take another go at it again here. Another chapter to that rivalry in Hogeheide. Who are you fancying on this course? Or do you maybe think that I'm completely wrong and that there's an outsider that's going to take the victory? No, I think that this season has been quite clear that there were um, two, three guys that were on another level. And with three, I, I count Pitcock as well, but Pitcock obviously is not uh, starting. So then you end up with two guys that are the main favorites. Van Aert, I think, has the better papers if you look at his results this season so far. You know, he has been going very well, very strong. Uh, while Van der Poel had his struggles, maybe both in terms of form and also the, the, the back that was hampering him in terms of racing. And I think that in the at the end of the day, this, those are going to be the two main favorites, the ones that we have to look at for the, the rainbow stripes. And before this week, I would have said that Van Aert was probably going to be the favorite in Hoger Heide. Uh, also considering that there was some rain forecasted, but... Now that the, the 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 course is probably not going to be hit by a lot of rain, you know, it's it's turning more and more into the favor of Van der Poel as well, and I think you know it's going to be a, a an, an amazing battle uh, between those two, and it would be a big surprise if somebody else can uh, mix with those guys. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This weekend we saw another confirmation that they are just so much better than the rest. Van der Poel demolished the rest in Besançon, and Van Aert did exactly the same in Hamme. Normally, we should be looking at a battle between these two riders, and while who will win, it's going to be very tough. I would go through a couple of race scenarios, and that all begins with the start. Van der Poel has the advantage over Van Aert there. Not only is Van der Poel a bit better starter, he also has the start row advantage. He can start on the first row, Van Aert can start on the second row. I would say that Van der Poel must go all out from the start. Every bit of advantage that you can get over Van Aert is something you must take. Van Aert on the other hand has the first choice of grid slot on the second row and he should just line up directly behind Van der Poel. By doing this he can follow Van der Poel immediately. Of course, the doors before him can close if Van der Poel has a lightning start, but it at least minimalizes the risk for him to be chasing Van der Poel right away. Van der Poel should go all out and try and force a situation like we have seen in Zolder, but also in Herentals, where he is leading the race together with Van Aert. Because I think that behind these two, there is a block of four riders, Zweig, Van Turenhout, Iserbiet, and Van der Haar, and if I were Van der Poel, I would not really like to have these riders around. It's always a bit of a doubt how the Belgian block functions, but I would not be happy to be in a two versus four situation in the position of Van der Poel. Like, for Belgians, you never know what they're going to do. You know they have tricks, so it's best to avoid that. At least that's how I view it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I think that if you look at the, the the cards Belgium has behind Van der Poel and Van Aert, obviously, then there are those four and they can definitely play a role if, for example, Van der Poel and Van Aert decide to not go uh, and work together after two, three laps. And um, if they kind of stall and the race pace is, is completely out, you know, then those guys from behind can definitely cause some trouble, especially for Van der Poel. I think that Van der Poel 
doesn't really have that support that Van Aert has. Um, Van der Haar has been struggling so in the, at the end late, later in the season so far, and you know Ron Haar might be someone that he can rely on a little bit, uh, but that is also a question mark in a way. Especially in the beginning of the race, Ron Haar can help him out, but you know in the end, uh, I think that. Van Aert would be better off in such a situation than Van der Poel. So that also means probably that Van der Poel knows himself that he has to to pace and has to make sure that that he and Van Aert are are, are going into a one v one because in such a scenario it's always it's always easier to focus on just one person and when you have two or three other guys around that are also racing i would say at that race as teammates for uh, for for van aert it's going to be yeah a, a risk for van der poel because you never know what tricks they will use and van aert might have some advantages in such a scenario and van der poel definitely doesn't have that exactly so that's also why i should just take the best start in the best case he ends up in a situation like in bls he took the best start there and by the time that Van Aert, who recovered from a poor start, had moved into second, Van Aert was already 25 seconds down. Of course, we know what happened in BLS. Van der Poel had a couple of punctures. Van Aert made the right tire choices and won that race. But that's the best case scenario for Van der Poel. In a mid-case scenario, he has Van Aert on his wheel and you go to a situation like in Herentals or in... Well, somewhat in Loonhout, although Pitcock was around, or in Zolder. And in the worst case scenario, you end up in a situation like they had in Zolder. And if you remember back to the Zolder World Championships, both Van Aert and Van der Poel didn't take all too much initiative. Only after 15 minutes, Van Aert tried one attack. He couldn't drop Van der Poel and Van der Haar. So they completely halted and then a big block of riders came back. There was Sven Nijs, Kevin Pauls, Klaas van Tornhout came back, later Tom Meuse came back together with David van der Poel. That's a bit of a risky situation and to be honest I don't think that Van Aert wants to be in that situation either. The entire season of Van Aert and Van der Poel is built around this race. For a rider like Izebiet he might have like something from it if Van Turen now takes the world title. Maybe a bit less if it's for a non-commercial teammate like Van Aert or maybe even Zweig. But it's a different dynamic than Van Aert. Van Aert is the leader of that team. His entire season is focused around this race. If he doesn't win, he doesn't care about the wins he has. If he doesn't win this race, you will feel that his cross season was disappointing. If he's going to come in a group with multiple Belgians and needs to let one go and Van der Poel at some point decides to call bluff and wait for Van Aert to do it or for somebody else to do it I don't think Van der Haar um, will be the one that then closes it so if Izebiet is gone for instance I don't think that Van Aert cares if Izebiet becomes champion it's for him about him winning the title so I think he would also prefer to end up in a situation with two and the same goes for Van der Poel I don't think he cares if Nieuwenhuis who will feature or Van der Haar wins the world title for these two champions they only care about one thing and that's themselves in this case there is also this thing that how much do you want uh, another to win because let's just pretend that it is going to be in a scenario where for example the Nizerbeet attacks goes away Van Aert looks at Van der Poel Van der Poel knows that if he's going to pull Van Aert back to Izerbeet, if that gap is around 10-15 seconds, that Van Aert is basically in prime position to counter the work that Van der Poel has done. In such a scenario, Van der Poel might be uh, in a disadvantage. Van Aert can then win w- win the race, and then later on we will say, yeah, but Van der Poel brought, brought Van Aert back. and it, They might play a lot of bluff, and that bluff might end up uh, killing both chances. But I don't think we end up in such a scenario. I think that both guys are very professional. Both guys are very eager uh, to win. Uh, and they will not let it come to such a situation. They will make sure that they are in a situation where they have at least a 50-50 chance of winning. And obviously they will try to get more than that 50% in, in terms of winning chances. 
Yeah, I agree. I don't think we are heading towards a Ponchateau scenario where Toon Arts in that case was the rider benefiting from Van Aert and Van der Poel playing games with each other. If we remember back to that race, we had a lot of attacks by both Van Aert and Van der Poel. They distanced the rest, but as they didn't distance each other, they let everybody come back. Arts then attacked. Van Aert was in a situation where he wasn't allowed to ride. Van der Poel was in a position where he thought, well, somebody else is going to solve it. I can't do anything. And I'm going to focus on Van Aert. And then Toon Aert benefited from it. I don't think that's likely. I think the likeliest scenario is one that we have seen a couple of times this season before. The two riders end up at the front of the race. They will divide the work, they will be looking at each other, but they will keep a decent pace that's quicker than the rest. They will look at each other, they will try and assess the strong and the weak points of the other rider and then come up with a plan. For Van Aert that plan has usually been this season aim for a sprint. What do you think will be the case in Hogerheide? The course has changed a bit, the barriers have now been moved to the final part of the course. What do you think the game plans will be? Do you think that it's even possible for one to drop the other on such a fast course without all too much elevation? The, the barriers might be a place where you can, I wouldn't say drop, but you can definitely gap somebody there. And that will obviously, you know, it will bring some more energy for the other guy to, to bridge that gap again. But the, the gaps will not be greater than one, two seconds. If it's going to be raining a little bit more and the course is going to be a bit tougher, obviously you have all these categories that go over the course. Uh, there is some rain that's predicted on, on Sunday morning a little bit, but it might become a, a tougher course. And then it's possible for both Van Aert or Van der Poel to, you know, to gap each other. Uh, but those barriers at the end of the course can become very important in the race because uh, it's it's a bit uphill if you jump them very well you can launch yourself and then you have you know basically only the stairs and and, and the off camber you do the you do the dive back to the road and then it's a long uh, half steep road that's that goes a little bit uphill uh, to the finish and the iconic <laughs> road on Hogerijde basically but it's um, yeah I think in it's 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 very difficult to gap somebody on this course, but it's possible if if some of the circumstances will help out. I think for this we just need to assume that both riders will be good. The backup on the pool won't play an issue, and then we should look back at some of the faster races we had this season, Herentals, and then we also had Zolder, of course, and we saw there that in those races it was usually. Van der Poel who pressured Van Aert and I think that that is the likely scenario. Seeing the flow of the season Van Aert can trust his sprint, he only lost the weird sprint in Benidorm. So where does Van der Poel go? I think indeed you come to the barriers. The barriers have been moved, they are a bit uphill and this season Van Aert he hasn't looked the most confident on the barriers and these barriers are uphill and even a bit more they're, they're a bit higher. The LED screens in the World Cup are about 35 centimeters. These are 40, the maximum that you can do. They are not LEDs, which means the top is not big, making it a bit harder. You can't just land your wheel on it. Races where Van Aert struggled, in Benidorm, for instance, he did not look great. In Dijem, he needed to run a couple of laps. But will it be enough? I think he can compensate for that in raw watts. So I think it's the most likely scenario that you're going to come down to a sprint here because these two riders, yes, Van Aert has a bit more power. Yes, Van der Poel is a bit better on the technical sections, but the differences are not big enough to make a difference. I don't see any of the two just straight up dropping the other on a climb here, and I don't see a stretch of Van der Poel through a number of corners that's going to chain them together so he gets a gap. I don't think that's likely either. I think a sprint is the most likely scenario. And then in that sprint, I think it's going to be tough. Van der Poel only had a clear sprint in Lunaut, but Van Aert was able to launch from behind there. I don't think that will happen here, seeing the nature of this sprint. It's also a bit uphill. 
Van der, Poel, Van der Poel became national champion on exactly this climb on the road that was. So, yeah, it will be interesting. I mean, I guess it's just a flip of a coin because I find it very hard to find a spot on this course where without mistakes one is going to drop the other. Mistakes can always happen, but details will decide who claims the world title here. Absolutely, and it's going to be the one that makes uh, that makes a crucial mistake uh, that that will end up losing losing the title i think because like you said we have seen if both guys are going to be in, you know in their full 100% in terms of what they are able to you know with the combination the road program and stuff but they will come here 100% prepared to win the worlds and we have seen that over the course of this season so far that if they are both at 100 percent it's a very close battle and it's the details that really do matter than in the end i think you know if you just take a race like lunout van der poel was able to to get van Aert, but then you know made a made a mistake van Aert came back and eventually won in the sprint so it's it's always it were always details when it was close when they were actually both able to to compete against each other it was very very close and it was only the details and mistakes that decided the race and on a course like this it's deemed to to go that way so uh, we are in for for maybe a very very close world we've mentioned the barriers a couple of times and i do think it's important that we do mention the fact that Adrie van der Poel is the course builder. He is the person in charge of the course. He decides what goes where, what features go where. And I think that it's weird that something like this is allowed in the sport of cyclocross. Like, we want to present the sport as a professional sport, but there's just a huge conflict of interest here. I don't believe that Adrie van der Poel is doing all of this to benefit Mathieu van der Poel. Because... In previous editions, like Falkenberg, he built a course that really didn't suit Van der Poel and that didn't have to do with the weather. And the course here in Hoge Heide is roughly the same as for the previous World Cups. Sure, the barriers have been moved, but it's a bit of an improvement of the overall course. It gives a very nice dynamic to the final part. As Isam just said, you have the barriers, then you have a couple of steep banks, you have a steep downhill, stairs off camera and then towards the finish it's going to be very spectacular if two riders are still together there or maybe even more than two but it does put Adrie van der Poel in a position where he could take advantage of the power he has I don't expect Adri to do this but the fact that the potential is there that's the thing with the conflict of interest it's always the potential that is there and you need to rely on the morals of the person involved to not take advantage of the power he has because Adri does have a lot of power he could for instance remove a couple of super muddy walking sections and replace them or he can add corners if he wants he can do whatever he wants for whatever reason he wants and that's pretty dangerous and something that should somehow be prevented in the sport but enough for that I would say we just need to trust Adri and I think to be honest the precedent set in the past gives us enough reason to do so so enough about that Isam I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the battle for third because we both seem to assume that Van Aert and Van der Poel in whichever order will end one and two yeah indeed I think that for third spot it I lean towards either Iserbiet or Laudensweek because I think both have been going well throughout the season. I think Iserbid obviously had his <laughs> his struggles, uh, but is on his way back. Looked very well in uh, in Besançon as well. Sveik is also looking very good. Got that second place in Besançon and yeah, seems to to have found it all. And on the course like we are going or heading to in Hogerheide, which is yeah, I wouldn't say not with the greatest of elevations fast course if it seems uh, like this and in such a scenario then I think Iserbiet and, and Sveik are probably in my opinion the two main guys for, for a third spot but there are definitely some underdogs I mean Van Turnout has been going well uh, and at the end of the day it's a world so there are some guys that, that always find something extra and 
there's always this 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 luck factor and 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 and, and you can always have the mechanicals they are always looking uh, to get you and on a course like this mechanicals are not major but it can happen and then it can always end up in a different scenario but i think for me personally i would look to Sveik or Iserbeet. Yeah, I think both of those two have a small step ahead of Van Turenhout, who is maybe the most consistent and the best out of the full-time cross riders. But he doesn't find a course to his liking, and I think seeing the level of Iserbeet and Zweig in Besançon, they will have a small step ahead of then Van Turenhout and Van der Haar, who, as you say, has been struggling he's not been fit he has had issues post nationals was sick before of course things can turn around in a week but i don't really see it happening the same goes for some riders behind that adams is coming from an injury or that crash in benidorm ron haar i don't really see it happening yet bit too inconsistent nieuwe house would love for it but we need to be realistic if we look at the racing in Besançon. We pretty clearly saw there that in the final lap, Isabit, who raced the day before, was the strongest. And Sveik, who came from that big group with a big attack in the final lap, looked to be able to match Isabit. So it would be between those two. But if I had to choose, I would actually lean even a bit more towards Isabit, seeing the fact that he did a double weekend last week. He looks eager, and I think he's perfectly timing towards this World Championships. He would be my favorite for third, but interested to hear your podium prediction. Uh, then you have to make the choices who's going to be first and second. It's Like I said, I, I was leaning more towards Van Aert, um, but looking at the course now, with the weather, I lean more a little bit to, to Mathieu van der Poel. So I would say that van der Poel... For me, is the main favorite. Will win it. Van Aert in second, and then I think that Iser beats can clutch third. I will be going with the world title for Wout Van Aert. I think he will clinch it in the sprint, very close sprint, but it's going to be an exciting one. I would say Van Aert will have the benefit in that ahead of Van der Poel, and then I will join you in predicting a third place for Eli Iserbeet. On to the women's race then. I think we are in for another duel there as well. There I think that there is no way we can go around Pietersen and Van Empel with Van Anrooy racing the women's under 23 race. This season Pietersen and Van Empel have clearly been above the rest and the world championships should only be a confirmation of that. Absolutely. I think that uh, we are in for, like you said, another duel. These two have been going at it the whole season have been performing quite well obviously I, I think Van Empel was struggling a little bit but overall both have been going very well and yeah it's 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 crazy to see that these youngsters are, are going to be the main favorites for for the the rainbow stripes and that we basically also can say that you know despite the fact that there are going to be other competitors and you never know because there are definitely some names that are um, that 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 might be be dangerous for those two. Definitely, if if, if the racing is, is going to be where they're going to be looking to each other a little bit more. Obviously, we know that the weapons of Van Empel in the last lap it's going to be very difficult then to to, to break her up. But then you have the barriers for for Peterson, so then they might look at each other a little bit more and. You can then name women like Alvarado, for example, but I think also Persico is definitely someone that can come out as as that third woman that might surprise. But I think that it's quite clear that for now, Van Empel and Peters are 100% the main favorites. As you say, there's a close pack of riders behind them. It's not the same as in the men's category where we expect Van Aert and Van der Poel to be levels ahead of the rest. You said something interesting this week to me when we weren't recording that the situation of Peters and Van Empel reminded you a lot of the situation that there was in the early 2000s in the 
men's peloton. Could you explain that a bit to our listeners as well? Because I thought it was a really interesting and valid point. Well, I mean, back in the day, it was Valens and, and, and Nice were definitely the two guys that, that could dominate a whole season. But then when you go to the Worlds, you had Mario de Klerk, Erwin Verwecke, who then rose from the death almost and uh, just two three weeks before for, before the worlds you get an indication that those guys might become ready for the worlds and they made a almost a goal out of it because they knew that it was going to be difficult for them to you know go with those guys for a complete season so then they were picking a little bit more their races and their chances and you know what we have seen this season that they were dominating the complete season only one that basically really brought a fight was was Van Androoy, but other than that, it was I think only a win from Brandt in an exact cross, and other than that, that that was it. So I think that that scenario is definitely not unlikely, and it really reminded me of that because the dominance that they have been going through is is similar, is very similar, and then it you know someone like an Alvarado might be looking at the world as her chance and. You know, Persico is someone that can always, uh, if 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 in one one hundred percent at the worlds, can surprise. As is, is a great talent, someone that already has proved it on the road and also proved it in fight field as well. If she has a good day, she can definitely go for a podium. Yeah, for sure. And I don't think you can rule out Brandt and maybe Anna Marie Worst. I mean, Worst in. The Ostende Worlds did the same. Like the entire season, you were like, okay, well, she's third, fourth, but yeah, it's a bit disappointing. No way she's going to do anything at the World Championships. And she almost became World Champion. Everything needs to come together on that one day. And if you have an amazing day there, your peak is perfect, your form is good, you feel fresh, a lot can happen, especially if you have the mental power and the boost of, okay, I can actually get a medal here, I can become champion. Alvarado is racing for the title and she already showed it at the Dutch National Championships on a course that didn't suit her that she can come close. So I don't rule out a scenario like that because if we look at this season, we have seen a couple of times and they are pretty rare because normally Peters and Van Empel were clearly better than the rest. But in a race like Benidorm, these two riders were so focused on each other that we had a number of attacks by Van Empel and Pieterse, and they evened each other out. And once they were together again, they stopped pacing, and Persico, together with Van Androoy, could come back. I think that if you are not Pieterse or Van Empel, you are hoping for such a scenario where they are focused on each other, and that Pieterse doesn't want to drag Van Empel to a sprint because she knows she will lose. Van Empel this season has not taken a lot of initiative and that could then open the benefit or like it it could open an opportunity for one of the other riders to attack and take advantage of it. I think a big question will be how much leadership in the race does Van Empel take? We've seen her struggle this season with having to take the initiative that all riders are looking at her all of a sudden and I don't think that that's completely gone. I mean she's taken big steps she's made improvements but still i think that van empel is a rider that makes quite some mistakes but gets away with it on the other hand if you make a mistake at the wrong moment it could completely be over so i think that will be one of the big questions if van empel is put in a situation that maybe isn't her pre-race plan we know she's pretty perfectionistic how will she adapt Improvise, adapt, overcome. How will she be able to do that in the race? Yeah, that 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 might be a um, very good point because I, I think that if you look at both women, they, Peterson, in my opinion, definitely improved on a fast course. Um, as we've seen in Benidorm, for example, you know, was able to bring up a fight, but in the end, it was clear that Van Empel is still the better woman in 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 in, in such a course. With the Worlds, they both are saying that they are not feeling the pressure, but I cannot believe that's the case. I think for both, it's an opportunity of a lifetime. Yes, they have still a very, you know, normally they would have a very big career ahead of them, but you never know what happens in life. So I think for both of them, they know that this is a very good chance to get 
the rainbow stripes and you cannot tell me that there is no pressure there it's i i can't i just can't believe it so they have to you know how are they going to deal with that pressure because they're both quite young yes they have been in in several scenarios and stuff but i think for both of them at the moment this is probably one of their most important races uh, that they have done in their career so it's going to be interesting to see how how that will play out in the race if it will influence the race van ampel like you said is somebody that has the tendency to make mistakes but she is able to compensate that with her, her pure power and, and and the talent that she has and will that be enough on on, uh, on saturday we have to wait and see there will be pressure but the game plan for peterson should be clear it doesn't really matter how many riders are around her in the final lap she must come to the barriers first at the same time these others will know that and will need to prevent it what peterson can't do is make the same mistakes that have happened a couple of times this season everybody knows that peterson will be jumping the barriers by now i think it's likely to assume that van empel will walk them of course she was bunny hopping them in the beginning of the season from time to time but i don't think that's going to happen again she's been walking them steadily and i assume that there's been some sort of hiccup on training that she doesn't have the confidence but in a couple of memorable moments in Tabor, Peterse had the opportunity to take a significant gap on the barriers, as we had seen a couple of laps before. The barriers here in Hoogheide are a light version of Tabor. They're both elevated and they're both high. These ones here are a bit higher, but there's a bit less elevation. Maybe it equals each other out. In Tabor, Peterse came with a late move, but got dive bombed by Vorst. She missed the opportunity to take a gap there. In Dublin, Peterson wanted to go to the barriers first, but she got overtaken by Van Empel the corner before. In Benidorm, Peterson wanted to take the barriers first, but she overshot the corner. Van Empel took them first in the end. Peterson can't allow that to happen, but at the same time, if that's her only card that she can play, her race strategy will be predictable. At the moment, I can't come up with a trick that she can pull, but she might be in need of a serious trick and then I mean like a trick of the skill that Sven Nijs pulled by going around the tree and riding the climb in the Zolder World Championships wasn't enough for Nijs. But I guess we will need to see the course because if you only have one trick to play on the barriers, it's obvious you're going to do that and it's obvious they need to stop you. I don't know if such an obvious strategy for the win can be successful. I think that's what you also need is some element of surprise in, in, in such an in such a move i think that you i think we have a brief we went over it a little bit earlier this season that we said that you know some things you need to keep a little bit secret a little bit down and you have to use it at the right moment the right time when it comes and that surprise element is is maybe something that you need to add in as well because if if you for example for a fun ample we have seen her not jumping the barriers if you for example actually train on it a little bit more try to gain some confidence are able to do it and jump in the last on the last lap when peterson takes the lead there and jumps on it as well i think if you are able to do something like that I, that would be a mental blow because i think that you would then expect to have some sort of a gap with uh, with uh, the demounting of the bike and then jumping up on it again so i think that's yeah the surprise might might help in such a scenario for sure but you also need to go for the obvious and need to make sure that the obvious is is something that you execute well because uh, the 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 biggest thing with something that is very obvious is that it's very easy to counter because you can see it already coming yeah and with the barriers being in the final part of the lap peterson should try and find something on the first part of the course where she can try something and if that doesn't work she can go for the obvious move of trying to make a difference on the barriers maybe it would be an opportunity for peterson to keep jumping the barriers behind the hand for the final lap but i don't really think that will make a significant difference Peterson should just go for it because every lap, if she's able to put Van Empel under pressure there every lap, it will be a lot of energy that Van Empel needs to put in. But still, I think the same goes here as went for Van Aert and Van der Poel. It will be difficult for one of them to drop each other. In the end, I think they will be 
together and it might not necessarily come down to a sprint but i think these two riders will eventually drop the rest persico is speaking towards this had a bit of illness not sure if it was a serious illness or more of an excuse to do some training like we have seen class from tornout come up with previously but i don't believe in a world title for persico in the sense that tactically and technically she isn't good enough you can't sit in third the entire race and then expect to get away with it. Yes, less corners than in Benidorm, but still, I think Persico will be fighting for third and after such a good season, Peterson van Empel, one of them will put a crown on it and I will probably say that it's going to be Van van Empel that takes the world title. She was also my pick in the preseason podcast and I will be sticking with that ahead of Peterson. And then in the battle for third, I think it's interesting... Alvarado and Persico. I know those are you, your two favorites. For me, I might add Brandt to it, but normally on this course, I would probably need to agree with you that Alvarado and Persico have a small advantage. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I I had in the, in in the preview of the season, I had Van Androoy, but that is. <laughs> We will go over that a little bit later. But I think that on a course like this with the barriers, maybe Peterson can surprise. She was very good in Besançon. He's, he's getting closer and closer. And maybe this world is enough for her to you know, to surprise us. So it will be a surprise for me if she d- is able to do it. But I lean towards maybe a surprise from Peterson. And then Van Empel in second. And I hope that uh, Persico can uh, get another nationality on the, on the podium. I will then take Alvarado for my third place just to mix it up a little and a final note on this. I don't think we can completely rule it out that one of the two top favorites in this race doesn't completely collapse during the race. They are young riders, pressure will definitely be a thing as you say and it's more than possible that one of the two will have issues with this or will have some issues in the race. and. Ah, I remember the previous Worlds in 2014 when we were in Hogerheide. Then the co-favorite in the women's race was Katie Compton. She was supposed to fight with Marianne Vos. Compton was pretty good that season, but she made some relatively silly mistakes in the early phases of the race already. The first time they went into the grass field, she went over her bars. So it is possible that under stress she makes mistakes. And I just want to have said it, you can't completely rule it out here. The big absent rider in the women's elite race is of course Sherin van Androoy, won a number of World Cups including Gavre and Zonhoven throughout the season. She opted to race with the under 23 category at the World Championships. If you've listened to the podcast over the season, you won't be surprised to know that both Isam and I think it's a sad and poor decision. So we won't discuss it too much, I'll just give a summary on it. At the end of the day, Van Androoy makes the choice to race with the under 23 and it's a risk adverse choice, a choice for safeness. She's pretty much guaranteed to win that scene, her level this season. Why do we think that it's a shame that she does this? Well, from a fan perspective, we would have enjoyed a battle of three riders in the elite category. But besides that, and here comes a cliche, you don't know what the future brings. Van Androoy at the moment looks to have maybe 10 years, is what some people are saying, of shots at elite world title. So she can complete a unique trilogy of winning all three. But who says that there are 10 years for her to win the elite title? Just because her age is young doesn't mean that there won't be other riders coming through the ranks. You don't know what the courses will do. Tabor next year could be an issue. She could also win there, but you just don't know what will happen in the future. So, yes, the under-23 title is something you can win, but the elite title is worth much more. That should be your priority, that should be your goal. The argument of, well, she is worse than Peterson and Van den Empel, we don't agree with it because in the Christmas period she was able to compete with both. And yes, Benny Dorm and Hama were not amazing, but that was due to hard training. Therefore, we think that she should have taken every shot she got at the elite title, and race with the elite. She ultimately doesn't do that, 
and that is in the end of the day her choice. She probably, one, doesn't rate herself at the level that she has, she's underestimating herself, and two, probably rates the under-23 title higher than we do. The argument of nobody remembers who ends second or third in the elite category doesn't really go up for us, because nobody remembers outside of the cross nerds who wins the youth title either. At the end of the day, you're remembered for your elite performances, and she's opting for the under-23 one, that's up to her, and, well, we can disagree with it, but at the end of the day, if she has no regrets after the race, it's fine. It's up to her, and enough about that. I'm wondering, Isam, do you think that she will face any competition in the U23 race, or will it be a complete walkover? Um, maybe herself, or the bike, uh, but other than that, not really. I mean... I can pretend like it can be very, very close race with someone else, but I think that we have to be honest here and 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 say that Van Androy made a step, like you said, uh, in the in in December in the month of December in the Christmas period, and that step is something that the other under twenty three women have not made. Uh, so it it would be wishful thinking to expect one of those women to step up and actually bring up a fight, but uh, they can surprise me for sure, and I think that. Uh, after Van Android, there is definitely uh, some some women that can that can definitely bring up a fight and that are you know a very interesting battle for for second and third that they can bring that up for sure. I'm not going to be as confident as saying it's going to be a walkover. Of course, Van Android has a very high level this season, but on this course, ah, she won't have the fastest start. We're going to see a nice sprint for the first corner between Schreiber and Backstead. And then they will lead for probably the most of the first lap. I do wonder if on a fast course like this, Van Androoy will be able to drop Backstead. I mean, Schreiber and Burkier are the two other contenders for the podium. But Backstead, she looked super strong the past couple of weeks. And I think that Backstead should be able to follow Van Androoy pretty long on this course. It's not the most difficult course. It doesn't have the most corners, which really benefits Backstead. And Van Androoy, if she's put in a situation where she really needs to make the race, it's completely different because this season she's mainly been following. In Benidorm, yeah, she did it there. She took quite some initiative, dropped a bunch of riders. So I do think that Van Androoy will in the end take it. But Backstead should definitely be able to go with Van Androoy for, like half of the race because it's going to be a similar race to Besançon and we saw there that there is quite a bit of potential for some grouped racing and that's something that really suits Backstead seen by not only her fourth place in Besançon but also just in general her results on the road and a couple of other strong performances on fast courses. It's definitely possible, but I think, you know, with Bakstedt in, in, in Besançon, it was clear that Worst and, and Van der Heide were able to, you know, to, to, to keep the gap that they had on Bakstedt and increase it in the end because uh, Bakstedt has that one issue, which is, is cornering and getting as fast as possible through the corners. I think that that might help Van Androoy, while Van Androoy is also not technically the strongest, but... I think that if Van Anrooy puts the pace that is a little bit higher than what, what Vorst and Van der Heide were doing in, in Besançon, and I think that she's capable of doing so, it shouldn't be uh, a, a challenge. But like you said, she is not someone that is known to start very well, while Buckstedt and Schreiber are definitely... <laughs> you can almost... You know, it's crazy how, how they are able to, to get themselves to the front, especially Schreiber is always someone that is going first first in the first turn so yeah it it can go wrong for Van Androoy but I don't expect it and I think it will be quite easy in the end but you know uh, if it doesn't turn out to be that easy you, we can maybe say that it was not a bad choice from Van Androoy in the end maybe but I think that's just the nature of the race I mean if you would have a muddy course here with quite some running Van Androoy would just run away from the rest with her running skill so it doesn't really matter 
all too much. I don't think we can base anything of the women's under 23 results and say, well, it was a good choice for her to not race elite or it was the right decision to race under 23. At this point, I've just completely accepted it. It's her choice and I can think that it might have been a waste of a year in which she could have won the elite title. But as said, it's completely her choice. I don't agree with the statement that she can only lose in the under 23 category. You had the same story for Bart Valens for the World Championships in Pontchâteau. The Belgian media were writing, for some reason, against their own rider. Bart Valens can only lose. If he wins the world title, he's just not lost it because he became champion last year already. It's not true. You win a world title. And yes, the world title in the women's under 23 category is not as important as the elite title. But it's also not just a jersey with some rainbow stripes on it. No, it is a world title that you win, and if something goes wrong, you can't base your choice of that because something could equally go wrong when you're leading the women's elite race. You can't keep that in mind, but as you say, she should have it, and I will think that, but I think that seeing Baxter and Schreiber usually going hard in the first part of the race, they will feature for a while before Van Android distances them. Baxter will end second, and for third place... I fancy Mary Schreiber ahead of Lynn Burquet, seeing how fast this course is. Burquet has been alright this season, but in recent weeks I do lean a bit more towards Schreiber, who I think is peaking at the exact right moment. I, I am in line with that, but just to switch it up, I will then say that because of her performance, especially in Benidorm, I will say that Burquet takes, takes uh, third spot. Then we can go on to the men's under-23 race. There, I think we can be relatively short about the main favorite. The last couple of weeks, Thibaut Nice has been on a different level. With the exception of Hama, where he needed to withdraw due to a puncture and a crash, he won in Benidorm, and in some fashion, after two crashes and a puncture, fighting in the defense of the entire race, coming around Del Grosso after the final corner, or well, not really around, he cut back. He ended third at the Elite Belgian Championship. He won in Zonhove in quite some style there as well, coming back after an incident in the sand pit there. He's been on a different level ever since Zonhove, and the beginning of the season was good, but once he fixed his back issues, things were good again for him. Normally, he should win this as well, and the course here in Hoogheide, it's a playground for him. I've said it already in the Benidorm preview and in the Benidorm results uh, podcast, and I will say it again. I think that Nice is is the clear favorite and the one that that is going to win it if there is no issues. I think that Nice, like you said, is on another level. Has been going very well. Um, you have obviously a very strong Belgium squad, uh, and you have Del Grosso as well from the Dutch side that that can bring up some sort of a fight. But if everything goes normal, Nice is the main favorite and the one that takes it. I was in Zonhove and the attack I saw there from Nice, in the beginning it looked like the other Belgians were playing team tactics, but wow, they weren't. They were just completely blown and Nice was the strongest. In recent weeks, as you say, Del Grosso has made quite some inroads. He rides for Maytek on the road. We know that he has been in, well, there are some road world tour teams that are fancying him. He's good on the road. But for now, he's riding for Maytek, and yeah, things are going good. I would say that he will be in the mix for the silver medal, but behind Nice. Assuming Nice reaches his normal level, he's going to take the win here quite comfortably. The Grosso can try what he wants, but ultimately, I think they will need to settle for a battle for the silver medal. And then, besides that, I'm fancying Verstringer and... Vitamosa, maybe Jent Michels, but normally I would say that Verstringen and Mosa have a couple of steps, in my preview at least, ahead of Michels and especially Visure, the defending world champion who yeah, really hasn't had a, a good season. But on a fast course, probably I'm fancying Del Grosso and Mosa a bit more than Verstringen, who likes a bit of a muddy course. But last year on a fast course in Fayetteville, Verstringen also definitely did a good job so i would say it's between those three for the remaining medals with del grosso having the advantage of being 
the best sprinter. He also won the World Cup in Besançon, which gives him a bit of a moral boost going into this weekend. So I would definitely sell Del Grosso takes a medal, but there's going to be two Belgians on that podium because, as you just said, they have a very strong team. Interested to hear your thoughts on the remaining podium spots and the podium prediction, actually. I I think I'm in line with what you said. I think that, you know, for the first spot, we don't have to (laughs) say it again, but, you know, Thibaut Nice. uh, I fancy Verstringen has been going well, but Del Grosso also has been going well. I think that Del Grosso is just going, you know, maybe he's going to have an issue with that Belgium block what they're going to be having in that race that might be an issue for him but if he has a very good day the Grosso might be uh, might get second but I would just say for string in 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 second and the Grosso in third interesting interesting I will be going with the win then for Thibaut Nice of course ahead of Del Grosso and then Vice Meuse in third place then on to the men's junior category I think that's the most open race of the weekend. Until a couple of weeks ago, Leo Bicio seemed the favorite. He won the World Cups in Tabor, Maasmechelen, Zonhoven, became European and French champion. But then in Benidorm, it wasn't great, did too much work there. In Besançon, had a mechanical, but before that wasn't doing all too well either. So do you think he's still the main favorite? Or do you think that we should maybe look at the Belgians who with Corses, Van der Berge, Nuyens and Van der Boer have a couple of riders who seem to be peaking at the exact right moment? Yeah, I think that, that that's <laughs> Van Tournauts and Van Tournauts did a very good job with, with those guys to you know to have them at the right moment, to be peaking at the right moment in for the Worlds. I think that, that Belgium also in this category is, is super strong. It's going to be difficult if if they ride with each other on a course where you can play some tactics. It is possible for them to uh, bring that the victory home, and they have, like you said, they have some strong riders. It's going to be interesting to see how that will play out. But I think it's going to be interesting as well. Like you said, the Biso is has been going very strong at the beginning of the season, and the further the season continued, it. it kind of struggled a little bit especially the last two world cup races for the under 23 for the juniors were was not really his uh, his you know his best outing might be a sign of, of of fatigue in some sort but if he can turn it around on the on the championship he is definitely a, an, an outsider which is a bit weird especially considering that uh, his results in the beginning of the season so I think Belgium is is definitely the main the main favorite. I think that the Americans have very good contender with with Andrew August. Um, the Dutch have definitely with Guus van den Eyde is is definitely someone that that I fancy a little bit on a course like this. Senna Remain. So there are some names. It's I think from all the categories, this might be the category where it's not the most obvious who is going to win, in my opinion. Yeah, because we can extend the list. Ian Ackert was good in Besançon, and if it's not an incident because he was good at last year's Worlds as a first, first year, we have Takat Zumbor, Barnabas Vash. It just goes on. Schwarzenberger, Jezek. It, it's difficult, but for me, I have this feeling that Andrew August, everybody is sleeping on this guy. I think that he is going to be surprisingly dangerous because his entire season has been focused around this race. His entire season. He's planned this season into perfection. Like, it's almost a Van der Poel style planning that he's done. He's planned to do all the World Cups. Well, he missed Zonhoven because he crashed in the pre ride and dislocated his shoulder. He looks to be fit again. But he raced Tabor, Maas Mechelen, won Koppenberg after that. Then did national championships, didn't race Pan American championships, taking a lot of rest, focusing on training, did a limited Christmas campaign, needed to skip some races due to illness and then Zonhoven, but in Benidorm came from way back, crashed in the first lap needing to overtake riders. Fourth place, ah, insane stuff there. In Besançon, again, from far back, losing a lot of time in the first lap, 
but he's starting on the first row at the World Championships. This is not the most technical rider, but here in Hogerheide, it's perfect for him. Ah, I think that AJ August is definitely going to be a serious contender for the world title. It would not at all surprise me if he's going to take it. But then, as you say, it's so open. There's so many other riders. But in the end, there are some riders that have like, had a couple of good results. And that makes it difficult because there's like this range like there's a lot of riders that can come to this that can like come into the range of a podium place on a very good day but can also easily be 15th one of the riders that is an example of this is daniel vis nielsen he had the perfect day at the belgian uh, at the european championships which took place in belgium in namur he ended on the podium there but he's also had terrible days out there i would then say that it's logical that we come to the most consistent riders of the season I don't think that the Belgians will play team tactics, as you say. They are juniors. You can't really ask them to do that either. I mean, this is the lifetime opportunity for them maybe to get a world title. So I would say that in terms of favorites, we should still consider Bicio, then put AJ August next to it, and then consider the Belgians. Van der Boer, it's a good course for him. Courses, although I don't know how he can deal with the stress. Then Van der Berge, not the perfect course for him. I don't really believe in a title for Wiesnaiens. So I would say those will probably be the favorites. And who takes it then? Uh, you might already tell it by me. I'm going to go with AJ August. I wonder what you think, Isam. Who, who for you, despite this long list? I didn't mention Van der Neinde, who's not been in great form the last couple of weeks. But... Difficult choices to make. Poor. Um, as much as I really want to see that, I lean more towards the Belgian riders, and I, I don't know. I think that that in the end, maybe the performance from from courses in Benidorm sticks with me a little bit. Uh, is somebody that knows how to how to clutch a, a race, and if it's going to be tactical, who knows. Um, I, I I disagree in a way that I I think that that especially the juniors is is a very it's a very close group they they are training with each other a lot they uh, Van Turnout is really trying to make a, a close group out of it is very involved with that uh, so I I don't I wouldn't be surprised if they can they can play some sort of tactics or be smart in 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 moments where you have to be smart I don't think that they enter a race with tactics but they might know a little bit how to play certain things so. I, I will stick with, with Belgium and then go with, with Jordi Courses. I do think that it helps that Courses, Van der Berge and Nuyens have all three already secured themselves of a deal at the elite team of Paul Sauze. So that will be something, but I, I still don't really see serious team tactics happening because for these riders, the stakes are a bit too high. And despite that they might be close, I do think that they all want to become world champion themselves too much and i don't think you can blame juniors for doing that even for under 23s it's still difficult i mean these are development categories you know it can make or break a career if you win junior worlds like it will give you so many opportunities after that it's difficult but I will be going with August, and I do think the Belgians will feature nicely. So I think August is going to take the win ahead of probably Van der Boer. I think this course is good for him. Seems to be peaking right as well. And then the third place will go to BCO. But then I will I will say that August will get second place, and then Seppe Van der Boer will get third. Then we can go on to the women's junior race. I think this is probably... After the men's under 23 race, or maybe even ahead of the men's under 23 race, the race with the clearest favorite. Laura Molegraaf has definitely stood out all season here. The only time she really came under pressure from another woman junior was in Tabor, when Gladonova was able to push her to the absolute limit. Ultimately, Gladonova cracked on the barriers in the final lap, leading to Molegraaf taking the win. Gladonova has been injured and sick after the Slovakian national championships 
haven't really seen her big question mark what her form is but Modegraaf normally really should be the clear favorite in this race yeah like you said this this is definitely one of those categories where it's quite clear who's going to be the main favorite and where surprises uh, you know could could play a role i think that both Holmgrens have been going well, especially in the later phase of this season. And if Molengraaf doesn't have a good day, then they m- might challenge her. But it's it's going to be very difficult. But you, you never know. On a course like this, it, it the surprises can always uh, look around the corner. It's no guarantee that if you dominated the whole season, you will dominate uh, probably the most important race of the season, for especially in that category. Uh, th- there, there's, there's no guarantee for that. So, there are definitely some, some women that can challenge Molengraaf if she has a bad day. But if everything goes well for Molengraaf, I think that she is the the clear favorite to win uh, the Rainbow Stripes. Yeah, behind Molengraaf, there are some riders that can feature if they have a good day, and Molengraaf really has a bad day. But normally, I don't expect it. But some names to Keep in your mind when watching the race and looking for other podium contenders. For Belgium, Fleur Morse, who had an injury. She crashed the week before Besançon and needed to skip that race. Didn't look too serious. She was back on the bike quickly. So that's one. The other one for Belgium is Xaide van Sinai. She ended second in the Besançon World Cup. Fast course should suit her. Then for Canada, the Holmgren sisters with Ava and Isabella Holmgren. Both have been consistently performing well in the Belgian races throughout this season. Then for France, Géry. She is a first-year junior, is pretty powerful, has had a pretty consistent season. Normally lacks a bit for the podium, but there everything comes together. She is able of getting it. And then, of course, Gladonova, who I already mentioned, Big question mark what her form is, but if she's able to put in a performance similar to in the early phases of this season, she can definitely compete. Her biggest struggle is technical sections. There aren't too many here, but don't be surprised if in some easy corners or steep downhills you see her lose quite some time. Finally, we have to also mention two British riders, Imogen Wolf and Kat Ferguson, both riders have been performing all right this season. Normally, I think they will struggle for a podium, especially Ferguson could have had a shot at the podium if she would have had a very muddy course here. That isn't the case, but still two dark horses to keep in mind. Isam, your thoughts on the podium? I would say uh, monograph. And then on second, in second, Ava Holmgren. I would say third, Isabella Holmgren. I think that they can get both on the podium. That would certainly be nice, but I think that we are going to see Molegraaf take the title ahead of Fleur Morse. And then with third, I'm, I'm torn between Eva Holmgren and Gladonova, but... I think I will go with Eva Holmgren simply because she's a second year and has a bit more experience. Gladanova at the European Championships definitely suffered a bit from pressure and stress, so I'm not too confident on that. Then one more race is some the mixed relay. We can be very short, some global information on it. It's going to have elite status which means that they will reward it with rainbow jerseys for the winning team six riders per country 10 countries participating concept we'll go over that probably in a very short recap podcast of the mixed relay after the event netherlands is definitely lining up with the strongest squad it includes van empel bentveld we didn't actually mention maybe has a shot at the under 23 race they also are lining up with Gus van der Einde. They, they have a very strong lineup with Del Grosso also in it. But Belgium, you can't count them out either. They are sending in Zweig. They are sending in Ribeiro. will be interesting. Uh, but what do you think? As you said, I think it will be interesting. It's a discipline that we that we don't see 
for a complete entire season and then we we get it at the world so uh, I'm open for surprises I think that especially on a, with these type of races there is a small margin of error nothing can go wrong um, so it will be interesting to see how it will play out I think the Netherlands definitely uh, on paper has the strongest team but that means that they you know they're not allowed to make any mistakes and that that will make it I think a bit more interesting but it's for me it's nice to see that there are some nations that brought quite a strong team and that are taking it serious and I think if you want to make this discipline something that will you know that that is going to stay for the next five to ten years you need to make sure that the countries are going to take it serious and it it seems that it's heading towards that direction but we have to, to to wait and see how that will play out in the next coming years yeah it's already nice that a big star like Van van empel is riding this race the best junior woman rider molengraaf is also racing we don't know the start orders and i think tactics in this race will be super important so the netherlands is lining up with molengraaf bentveld van empel van de einde del grosso and kamp belgium is lining up with van sinai brouwers riberol jamin Wiseure and zweek these two countries should be fighting for the victory and normally netherlands should have the strongest rider in almost every category i mean Zweig is stronger than Kamp, but Del Grosso is a bit stronger than Visure. Van der Einde looks to be a bit stronger than Jamais. So if you compare it that way, normally the Netherlands should win it. But again, how will they do it tactically? In terms of some other countries, I think the British team is quite interesting with K, Backstead, Ferguson, then Akers, Blackburn, Mean, shot at a medal. I think that the team for... France is pretty good with Dubot, Ledanet, Bissio, Clausel, Burkier, and Géry. The American team does not look bad either with Curtis White, Andrew Strohmeyer, Daniel English, Clara Honsinger, Madigan Munro, and Villa Lopez de San Roman. Also Italy, the winners of last year with Venturelli, Zontone, Persico, Cavoyeri, Toneati, and Fontana. Looks pretty promising. And even Czech Republic with Hanakova, Zemanova, Heladikova. Then in the men's side, Jezek, Fiala and Boros is not too bad either. So I think it will be an interesting battle. Oh, I, I even forgot Canada because Canada are also bringing a strong team with both the Holmgrens. Then Magali Rochette, Ian Ackert. But then their problem is in even Russell and Michael van den Ham, the men under 23 and men elite riders for them. That's where they will struggle. But again, it will be interesting, but... I don't think we can make a prediction because we don't know the start orders and I do think that the start order will be super important. I would have one of my strongest riders start, one probably my men under 23, so you can already position yourself at the front. I would imagine it's easier to race from the front of the race in the defensive than needing to come back i i would say that's probably easier also what we kind of saw last year where belgium was gambling on Suter, closing everything at the end but that never really working out i agree i think that with my experience as a track and field uh, athlete i think that especially in these these type of uh, events you want to have the the strongest has to start and the strongest has to finish and you have to make sure that the ones in between manage it well uh, and then you can maybe mix it up a little bit because now you have no four but six uh, try to 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 get uh, someone a little bit weaker after the one that is a bit stronger so it's basically every time it you have a gap and then from there on you can uh, you know give a little bit back of your advantage to then create a gap again so that would be my strategy but i think that in the end the teams will will you know will, will see how it will go and the ideal strategy will maybe decide will be created in in who knows two three four five years so we'll see how it plays out for every country and i think the lessons will definitely be learned from from this event that brings an end to a long and big preview episode for the Cyclocross World Championships. Isam, thank you so much for being here to take a look ahead with me. 
Yes, thank you for having me and thank you for the listeners who, who are still listening <laughs> for bearing with us and uh, I'm excited for the World Championships for sure. Make sure to send us some emails on noah at cyclocross with three s's.com with some of your reactions or leave them on YouTube. We enjoy reading them. We will be back probably on Friday with an episode about the mixed relay and we'll be watching there on site, hopefully gathering a bit of quotes and interviews to put in. If that doesn't work out, we'll be back on Saturday with the first day of racing. Thanks everyone for listening and goodbye.